welcome to Houston. For those who have come from outside Houston, and uh, it's good to be here, I uh, would like to uh, introduce my wife. My wife, Carol, is with me today. She, she had to show up because she uh, played hooky a couple times this summer, and uh, so she, she has to make up for that. Uh, but she's doing well, and, uh, and I'm very pleased with that. But uh, I, I am very pleased to come and speak, and, and Lou, uh, he may have given me a topic, but he didn't announce it, so that means I can say anything I want, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I, do have, I do have some good news, though, and, uh, and, and the good news is this, that it is very clear that when governments uh, and government officials act, you know, outside the law, uh, it's an encouragement for individuals to act outside the law. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you're looking for a revolution, believe me, there's going to be a lot of activity going on. Because just think about it. Uh, we could have, we could start with this little uh, insurance, uh, uh, well endowed insurance program called Social Security, run honestly and ethically and above board. But lo and behold, they complain with a guy who, like Madoff. Madoff goes and does the same thing, you know. <laughs> but but isn't it wonderful? Who's going to be Secretary of Treasury? You know, in this need. I mean, he doesn't believe in paying taxes. So what the heck? <laughs> you know, well, what is going to happen these days? I mean, we may truly see some exciting times ahead. <laughs> but uh, but no, he he believes in collecting taxes now, and he'll probably come, he'll probably be very ruthless in collection of taxes. But uh, obviously, it does make a, a strong point. Now. You, a lot of you may have seen a bumper sticker that I have in my office, and because it's been on the internet, and yesterday I had some young kids in the office, as not too unusual, and the students came in and they wanted to get their picture with the bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he allowed me to be in the picture too. <laughs> uh, but this bumper sticker is very simple. It says, don't steal, the government hates competition. <laughs> And they don't like competition. They don't like competition in running your life. They want to run your life for you. They don't want competition running the economy. They want to run the economy. And, of course, uh, they don't like anybody to run their own affairs overseas. They think they're capable and, and have this obligation to uh, run everybody's affairs overseas as well. So it, it boils down to a very simple philosophy of what we need. We need to get the government uh, you know, out of our lives, out of our bedrooms, out of our walls, off our back, and out of foreign countries and uh, in the meantime, just get rid of the Federal Reserve. <laughs> Over the uh, many years of speaking out and speaking out uh, against the Federal Reserve and sound money, it had to be a unique crowd. You know, those conspiracy nuts and, uh, and, and these people to bring up the subject, yes, we should get out of the U.N., and yes, we should get rid of the Federal Reserve. And in that special crowd, you would get these cheers. But something has happened. Something dramatic has happened. And it's happening on the campuses of this country. And some people give me credit. I don't take the credit. I, tell you, I give credit to uh, the academicians, the many people who you've heard speak here, and uh, groups like the Mises Institute have, who have changed, changed attitudes. And uh, it isn't just a few anymore. It isn't just a unique uh, crowd that believes in the conspiracy. I mean, it's so dangerous now that it has infiltrated college campuses. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't have possibly influenced these college kids. I mean, one person can't do that. So they, some of these ideas have infiltrated, and it's getting to be very serious. Because you all know the story about what happened at the University of Michigan. I mean, that was startling. It scared me. Because here I am. It was after the debates over in Detroit. We went over to Ann Arbor, and I got there a little late. And there was a little bit of agitation and frustration, but it was, it was dark. And, uh, but there was a large crowd there. I couldn't see the crowd very well. It was that dark. But they said there were a lot of, a lot of young people there. So I went on and gave my talk and, uh, and, and alluded to the monetary system and the Federal Reserve. And all of a sudden, a bunch of them started burning Federal Reserve notes. <laughs> and then they started chanting, and the Fed, and the Fed, you know. I mean, where, where did this all come from? So that... <laughs> 
So uh, I'm on the receiving of that, that, uh, that if information and, and that message. Uh, they were telling me to end the Fed. So I said, well, that does sound like a good idea. Uh, <laughs> so we have promptly introduced, once again, the bill to end the Fed. So. But when uh, we had our little uh, rally up in, um, up in uh, Minneapolis, along with, I think it was another political party down the street had another, <laughs> another rally and a convention, we had, we had ours. And lo and behold, we had speakers there that had the audacity to mention Austrian economics. Believe it or not, they started cheering Austrian economics. I mean, what, what, what is going on? There, there, there is great progress going on. In Washington, um, you can see some progress. They're thinking seriously about what's happening because guess what? They're scared, and rightfully so, and they don't understand what's, what's happening. And, uh, and Lou has alluded to it, the fact that other members do now uh, ask questions. Before, it was usually uh, chuckling and laughing and forgetting about it and say, there he goes again. <laughs> but but now, now they will. They will. They will come up and they're very serious about asking it because frequently the um, people on the uh, financial state, uh, stations of all places, I mean, they'll come up and they'll say, well, you know, he predicted this and predicted that. It wasn't that I predicted it. I just read what a lot of you people write about and, and, and learn how Austrian economics works. So it isn't a great thing to predict. It, you know, it's like it takes a genius to predict that if you print a lot of money, it loses its value. <laughs> <laughs> You know, now, now that's really brilliant. <laughs> so, um, and then, then this, this whole idea that a bubble is forming. Uh, a lot of you in this room probably remember the name and know the name Jim Grant. And Jim Grant has, is a good Austrian economist and a good writer. And he, I invited him down to talk to some members of Congress right after I went back into, uh, into Congress in 1997. And he came and we had, a, we had a small group. 1997, he took his whole time talking about the horrendous debt being built up by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I mean, we all knew about it and talked about it, but it was really on his mind. But once again, that doesn't tell you that um, we know a whole lot about timing because uh, things were bad in 1997, 1998. There was a bubble, malinvestment, too much debt, had to have a correction. But how many times has it been papered over? I mean, they've been able to achieve it. I look at the financial system uh, dating back uh, to the date that Lou mentioned, uh, August 15th, 1971. And uh, then uh, we might have been forced into a real serious monetary reform, but it didn't happen. Uh, the confidence in the dollar was restored. We had an adjustment. Prices went up, and we went on. But in every crisis since, in every recession, they've always been able to do exactly what they had been doing. Print, spend more money, and run up more debt. And you gotta, you gotta understand from from where they're coming from because it worked to to that degree. You know, the recession would go down and it would come back. This last go around, though, uh, with Greenspan and Bernanke, I mean, especially in, in the year uh, 2000, that little recession that came, it's this anticipation. Before, they used to wait, oh, well, is the, the uh, economy is getting too robust. Uh, the treatment for a robust economy is uh, recession. Of course, you know, a robust economy should be good. But anyway, they would bring, they would bring on, they would bring on, on the recession. But these, this last 10 years, Years, they never allowed the recession to come. They anticipated, and you know, every time it takes more and more and more, I blow the blah 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 bigger and bigger. So now, uh, since we are uh, uh, the recipients of benefits of a, uh, being able to issue the reserve currency of the world, all this uh, paper manufacturing and issuing of paper has been a worldwide event. So this bubble is, uh, I don't think it's. Um, overstating the point that this, this bubble is the biggest of all history. And there's been a greater trust placed in us, uh, the American system, the, uh, the paper money, our Federal Reserve, our great wealth, and unfortunately our great military, because military can convey confidence in a currency. 
You know, if there's a war going on and one country's beating the other country, their currency goes up with, with a victory. So there's a lot of the, uh, you know, the perception of who will be victorious. So we came out, uh, uh, liberty didn't come out so well after World War I, but uh, economically we came out pretty well. World War II has been on and on. So uh, we, we've had this tremendous bubble build. And uh, even in the old days, they had inflation. But it was regional. They, uh, it was never so universal and so worldwide. I sense in Congress today that uh, the members of Congress are very, very worried and, and frightened. But lo and behold, you know, they give $350 billion to Treasury, and uh, it didn't seem to solve the problem. Uh, markets haven't improved any. So they said, well, Where'd the money go? Oh, well, we don't know where it went. Why would you ask this question like that? So what do you do now? What should we do now? Well, give us another $350 billion. And, uh, and what did the Congress do? I mean, last week we had two bills we debated related to the TARP funds. And uh, the money, uh, I mean, the rubber stamp was put there. So the new administration will get that $350 billion. But uh, obviously, uh, the spending and the borrowing and the inflating that created our problem is the only tool that they have left. And the only thing that's holding it together is a remnant, a small amount of confidence left in the system. Right now, it's uh, still so the confidence in the dollar. I am reminded about, and a few of you in this room must, I'm sure, remember, uh, in the 1970s, <clears throat> John Exter, who had had some experience in uh, central banking, he had this neat graph or, or demonstration where he had an inverted pyramid. And of course, at the bottom of the pyramid uh, was, uh, was gold, and above that, the different currencies. But even then, when he proposed that picture of, uh, of how the economy inflates, there weren't even any derivatives that existed. And just think of what his concept was and his concern, and then you put, uh, what? $70 trillion worth of derivatives up at the top, and, and uh, there's a tremendous uh, rushing out of the uh, lesser desired assets and rushing uh, toward the bottom. But it, on days, I just wonder exactly where we are in this gravitating down toward the peak and down to uh, uh, those very limited assets, which would be uh, gold and silver. But right above that still is the dollar. Right, the dollar uh, and treasury bills. I mean, people, they don't know where to go. They don't understand it very well. So, so they have billions of dollars. You can't go and get a CD. You got to buy treasury bills and, you know, they're not hard to make. We, we, have, <laughs> we, can, we, can, we can create those. We can create those out of thin air, you know, rather easily. And, uh, and, and you know, uh, down at the bottom, though, we, uh, we would have several of the currencies uh, that people still cling to. The, the yen isn't all that bad. The euro is, hang, is holding its own. But I think uh, the, the British pound isn't doing too well and uh, may not hold us. So they'll be whittled away. They'll be whittled away. But in the meantime, uh, the concept of central banking has not vanished. Yes, we have these growing number of kids on the campuses and a lot of people like you out there still and have understood this for years, but uh, there's still a lot of people who believe very strongly in central banking. So as our movement grows and makes an effort to get rid of the concept of central banking and the Federal Reserve, we also have uh, the group that uh, have had the greatest deal of influence on our government, those who tend to have control over uh, the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. You know, it seems like Goldman Sachs has an influence on government, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. <laughs> but those individuals um, who know about it uh, are making their plans. Uh, about a week ago, we were told, and I went back a day early because I was told that uh, uh, Bernanke would be before our committee on Monday for some hearings to go over uh, the TARP funding uh, issue. And when I got there, he, he wasn't there. And they said, oh, no, um, he, he couldn't make it. He was elsewhere. But it turned out that was the day, if you remember, he gave a speech in London on a Monday morning. And uh, that was the news. He was over there. That was the cover giving a speech. The speech was broadcast. It was on our news. And uh, you can get the script. And we had uh, the vice chairman of the Fed come be before the committee. But what they didn't tell you is the day before, 
he was at uh, in Basel, Switzerland, at the at uh, Bank of International Settlements, meeting with a few of his buddies, you know, and they were talking. But uh, I asked the the uh, uh, the um, assistant uh, to Bernanke whether or not we could have those minutes, but he said, <laughs> no, "No, you're not allowed." <laughs> no, he didn't say that, but. And, and I closed my statement by saying, yes, I'm not allowed to have those because under the law, he doesn't have to tell us a thing. Now, you know, we complain about $700 billion and the Treasury blowing 700 and we can't make them listen to us. But that's peanuts compared to the trillions that, that the Federal Reserve has, uh, has control of. But uh, they know by now that this system is not viable. The way I see it in my mind is that the uh, very uh, weak system that came out of Bretton Woods was the fiat dollar standard. And uh, it's lasted up until now. And it built a financial uh, pyramid of, uh, uh, of debt and, uh, and it's, it's worldwide. And that uh, that system has come to end because that's it's quits functioning. I mean, uh, the, everything is collapsing and closing down, and production is going down, and and all the things that uh, that we are witnessing. But the dollar is still existing, but they're still trying to re. Uh, vitalize what built the big bubble and of course that is the creation of money and the creation of credit but the one thing they don't have any control over is the um, is the restoration of confidence since we the country, the world has lost confidence in the dollar system the only thing the politicians and the bankers have is to keep doing the same thing that gave us all the trouble and that is print 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 and uh, this, this is what they're up to. I, I think it's just a matter of time now. I do not, I'm absolutely convinced in my mind, I may be wrong, but I'm absolutely can, convinced that they can't go back and pick up the pieces. Uh, they're, they're not, it's sort of like going back, the British wanted to go back and restore the, the uh, uh, pound at the old gold standard, which obviously didn't work. We can't go back to the old gold standard. We can't go back to the Bretton Woods. We can't go back to the post-Bretton Woods standard. And uh, therefore, something, something new has to come up. They're planning their, uh, they're, they're making their plans for what they think they should have. And, and I, I'm, I'm very confident that they would like to see uh, you know, a, a one, one world central bank. Uh, the dollar hasn't done the trick. Uh, the, we were entrusted to run the system, but now they will have to take it away from us and take it away from the dollar, which means if they get away with it, they might be able to keep things going or get things started again, but I think we're going to be in charge. I think that we are destined to be a much poorer nation. That is what the handwriting on the wall. Of course, the world is going to be poorer too, and the question is, is whether they can devise a system. So time is short, uh, and the arguments are, are very, very important, and uh, I think we're making great progress. But the, uh, the battle is going to be on the campuses. Uh, and uh, just hopefully uh, we have enough time to stimulate enough young minds that uh, they can get in the right positions uh, to give, give the right answers. This is one place where I've been tremendously encouraged on, on, on the campuses. Uh, dur during the campaign, and uh, there's a youth group, uh, the Young Americans for Liberty has been an uh, outgrowth of what we're doing, and, uh, and uh, I'm helping to the best of my ability to have them get organized and we will be testing that. We will be going to the campuses. If I enjoyed traveling more, I would do it more often. Uh, but uh, traveling, uh, traveling is a job for me. I've had a lot of nice invitations lately. I've, uh, and uh, I can't tell my wife all about these, but she might decide to like to take one. We had one from, <laughs> we had one from Hong Kong the other day, and uh, just this week I had one from Italy and uh, Turkey. We've had several in Eastern Europe, and. The way I see this is, you know, with the internet, they do hear and, and, and understand what we're talking about. And, but it must be like 5 or 10%, maybe less, hopefully 10 or 15 or 20%, but obviously never, never a majority. But it isn't like it's uh, just in Auburn, Alabama. That isn't where it is. I mean, it is out there. And uh, the other day I was coming back from the Capitol on a... Uh, they were all, a bunch of men were all bundled up because it was very cold, and they, they came over and they were excited. They wanted to meet me. I said, where are you from? They said, New York. 
And I says, uh, what part of New York? Where were they were from upstate. And I said, aha, uh-huh, you're from the part of New York nobody ever hears about. And I said, I know that you're out there, and I understand, because they were enthusiastic, and uh, yet they're still in the minority, you know. But once again, uh, we have been reminded very many times that the numbers, and I remember Leonard Reed saying this so often, it's not a numbers game. It's not a numbers game. You don't say, when are we going to get 51%? Well, we just need influential people, and that is what's happening. And that's why uh, the Mises Institute deserves support, because they are changing the numbers. I mean, all the people that have been helped to get their degrees and get teachers in the right places, that's where the, that's where the future is. And uh, right, right now, uh, it hasn't had a reflection in Washington, but it's starting to. It's starting to have a reflection. They're starting to ask about Austrian economics, and they're asking the right question. And uh, believe me, you, you can't have any influence until they start asking the questions. They're asking the right questions. They're worried and they're concerned. They know this system is, isn't, isn't working. And uh, I, am, I am encouraged in that sense. But it, it, in the other sense, though, I am very concerned because uh, it can get be pretty rough. And my main goal is... Uh, of course, I want to live in a prosperous manner, peacefully, and, uh, and uh, have as much enjoyment as possible. Um, but it isn't the prosperity that motivates me. I do know that if prosperity is my goal, the freer the society is, the better it is for us. I, under, I under, understand that. But my biggest concern, of course, when I see what's happening is a threat to our personal liberty. And I have always argued, I would argue the case for liberty, because for me it's a moral issue, it's not a pragmatic issue. I would argue the case for liberty because I just want to be left alone. That's what I want to be. <laughs> But, but fortunately, we don't have to take that case because uh, not only can we be left alone, that is, what, that is the philosophy that takes care of the maximum number of people with the maximum amount of prosperity. But today, we live in an age where I think it's really coming down to the wire. I mean, uh, if we'd have had this climax uh, of, and, and, and dissolving of the system as we're having today around the world in 1971, we would have been in a lot worse shape, believe me. Uh, I, I just think we're in so much better shape now to argue our case. We have better methods of, of transmitting our information. I mean, it's, uh, I, I mean, we make fun and laugh sometimes at radio talk shows, but we've made a lot of use out of radio talk shows. But with the internet and the communications that we have now, are just fantastic. I mean, the fact that somebody in Italy might want Ron Paul to come over there, that's pretty weird, you know. <laughs> but uh, but this, this communication thing is fantastic. So uh, there's every reason to be encouraged. I don't think uh, we have to worry about the philosophy. I believe that, uh, you know, probably in this room we can agree on 99% of the things because, you know, you don't have to be real smart to tell other people how to live. You just have to be smart enough to uh, lay off and leave them alone. I, I thought, you know, the, probably the most uh, significant statement I made to undermine the campaign, the presidential campaign in this day and age, was telling people, well, I, I would be president. I would serve as president. I want to be president. I said, but not because I want for what I want to do. Because I don't want to run your life. I don't want to run the economy. And I don't want to police the world. I don't know how what you want to do with your life. I don't know how to dictate to the economy. And I certainly don't want to be involved overseas. But you know, you can turn that around and say, not what you don't want to do. What do you want to do? Well, you want to preserve liberty. You want to preserve the greatness of this country. And in the meantime, we will protect the prosperity of this country. But if we concentrate on that ideal of liberty, I believe that we can find all our answers. Thank you very much.